And a good Tuesday afternoon, everybody. I'm meteorologist Tim Pandages here with your tropical update. We're now talking about major Hurricane Ian that has topped out at a Category 3 status so far with incoming intensification expected. Today is Tuesday, September the 27th, 20, 2022. So what's changed since we last spoke yesterday? Well, Ian strengthened to a Category 3 hurricane. In the process, it's also made landfall in western Cuba. Early this morning, around 3.30 a.m., it was overland for about six hours, and now it's moving offshore. And now the threat, the landfall threat for southeast uh, or southwest Florida, excuse me, has shifted southeast of Tampa. I'm going to show you that brand new track update. And we are now getting updates from the National Hurricane Center hourly. We typically hear from them about eight times a day with eight separate advisories, three hours apart. Now, since it's closing in on the southwest coast of Florida, we're going to get those updates hourly. Still, the track changes coming four times a day. And that next track change will be around 5 p.m. Eastern time today. So here's how it looks on infrared satellite imagery. I mean, after making landfall, it is really held together its structure. We knew this would happen because the uh, low lying areas in western Cuba, not all that mountainous or the topography is not really supportive of tearing a system apart. So, and it was only over land for six hours. So it wasn't enough time to really disrupt a major hurricane like that. Now it has emerged over the north coast of Cuba, over the warm, deep waters of the Gulf of Mexico. Intensification is back underway. We're up to 120 mile per hour winds. After landfall, it did knock winds down, sustained winds down to 115, but overall it still remained a category three, uh, now up to 120. It is moving off to the north at 10 miles per hour. However, it did have a seven millibar drop in the last hour. So now we're down to 955 millibars. That central pressure drops usually first, and then we see an increase in the sustained wind. So that's likely coming. It's not out of the realm of possibility. In fact, it is expected that this gets up to a Category 4 storm. Now here's a 12-hour loop showing the landfall near Pinar del Rio overnight, lifting north. Notice the eye gets a little more ragged looking, and then once it's back over its fuel source, it starts firing that convection all around that core. Hurricane Hunter aircraft flying through the eye wall and the core uh, saw winds of 110 to 120 at flight level and down to surface. They were they were just as strong in some cases. So very, very strong winds there and that warrants the 120 mile per hour sustained winds of a category three hurricane. Now, bigger picture here. This is visible satellite imagery, a very stretched out storm. Some of this is getting pulled north as it's interacting with the trough diving in in the northern parts of the country. There's the eye, a rather small eye in a large system that spans over 600 miles north to south. In fact, a 20 nautical mile uh, size diameter I uh, with Ian at this current time based on the most recent update from the National Hurricane Center. And typically the average size of an, of an eye in a hurricane is between 20 and 40 miles. So this is right in line with that. The smaller the eye gets, the more fierce the winds are. So think of it as a contracting eye. It's the law of the conservation of momentum, right? So when you, it's this, the ice uh, figure skater uh, analogy here. When the figure skaters got their arms out wide, they spin a little slower. When they contract their arms and spin, they spin faster. Same with a hurricane. When that eye contracts and gets smaller in size, a pinhole eye, we call it, it spins faster. We saw that with Hurricane Andrew way back uh, when that made landfall in South Florida several decades ago. We're now in range of radar out of Key West, and we can certainly see where that eye is. It looks larger here on satellite on radar imagery, but this really gives us a feel for that eye wall structure. Look at that. That's where you're going to find the strongest of the winds. Right now, it looks to be just to the north of that eye center and off to the northeast. Typically, the northeast quadrant is going to find the strongest winds, and as it gets closer to land, you'll find the highest storm surge values. A lot of these bands are stretching all the way north and into South Florida. In fact, they've been doing so since yesterday evening. Within these outer bands is a tornado threat, too, because think about it. We've got a big spin all already in the atmosphere here and on those outermost bands it's easier to ignite a little spin to go with a, a funnel cloud or a tornado or even a water spout just offshore in those outer bands so that tornado threat will be on top of the numerous other threats flooding threats storm surge of course you've got the wind and the heavy heavy rainfall that could amount to one to two feet in some locations so now that it's back over open water it's over its 
fuel source. And we had talked about the heat potential energy that's available at that time before uh, mid landfall in the Caribbean, now in the Gulf of Mexico. And the warm waters are evident everywhere in the Gulf, everywhere in the Caribbean, pretty much everywhere in the Atlantic Basin this time of the year. Now, it's warm water on the skin of the ocean surface, but in this particular part of the basin, in the southern portions of the Gulf of Mexico, the Caribbean, that warm water extends down in some cases, over 100 meters of depth. Now, why that's important is because when you get storms like this that are violent in nature, they are sloshing around the ocean, mixing it up, something called upwelling. And if the skin of the ocean is the only thing that's warm enough to support tropical activity, well, you get a major hurricane that moves over that, it quickly mixes up cooler waters from below and cancels itself out and, and nullifies its fuel source. Now, when you've got heat potential here and warm, deep ocean water, you're continuously mixing up warm water, so replenishing the warm water at the surface all the time. So you've got plenty of energy available here, and it's going to be along that path pretty much all the way to landfall in southwest Florida. Speaking of landfall, let's talk about that brand new forecast cone from the National Hurricane Center. Now, there are some a few tweaks in here in terms of its intensity forecast. That's always the toughest part of forecasting a hurricane or a tropical system, the intensity, because there are so many factors at play here that can either lead to a big jump in intensification or say dry air, for example, that could get sucked into the circulation and halt intensification or even drop it on off. Now, compared with yesterday's cone, this is expected to be up to a category four with 140 mile per hour winds. Today, it's maxing out the forecast, maxes it out at a category four still with 130 mile per hour winds. Really, if you're encountering that, it's not going to make a huge amount of difference. The damage that it will cause will be the same. But just to show you the changes here in intensity forecast as we get a little bit closer. So category four by as early as this evening. In fact, I, I wouldn't doubt if I get we get this upgrade around five o'clock this evening with the latest updated advisory. And that's also when we get a new cone. We lift north, still a category 430 by tomorrow morning around sunrise. And then we get more of that northeasterly pull. And I also want to draw your attention to this. Notice these time intervals here, these lines, get closer together. This is a symptom of this storm moving into a weak steering environment. And what do I mean by that? Well, a lot of times these, these storms are steered by upper level winds, the jet stream, other features in the atmosphere. Now it's going to be moving into an area where there's nothing to really nudge it along. So it's going to kind of sit and loiter for a little bit as it moves onshore likely as a category three storm major hurricane 125 mile per hour winds by wednesday late afternoon and early evening now also another change is where that median line is for a potential landfall now falls to the southeast of tampa if this were to verify here this would be a better scenario for the tampa bay area a worse scenario though for areas like fort myers over to port charlotte and in this type of scenario, miles matter in terms of storm surge values and the type of impact you see. Just a slight nudge farther to the northwest could mean much greater impacts in Tampa, slightly less of an impact in Fort Myers and Port Charlotte. So it's all going to depend on what outcome verifies here. And really anything within this cone is fair game. So as it moves inland, of course, it's away from its fuel source at that point. So we see rapid weakening here. But as a tropical system moves over land, it doesn't just dissipate with the wind values. It's got to rain itself out. There's tons of tropical moisture. So it doesn't cover a lot of ground. By the time it moves on land around 7 p.m. on Wednesday, 24 hours later, it's just north of Orlando at this time, still packing 70 mile an hour winds, a high end tropical storm. But it's also still over Florida, so it doesn't cover a lot of land, a lot of real estate. And at that entire time, it's going to be pouring rain. So we're looking at high rainfall amounts likely with this system as it moves over land and slows down a bit. Now, here's a look at the Euro and GFS. We've been consulting these models pretty much since the onset, since the origination of this tropical wave, tropical wave 98L. Remember that? About a week ago, we were talking about that. Now, here's the latest runs. And a lot of this is a little bit concerning because of what the models show in terms of the overall track. You can see it does fall and coincide with that forecast track cone I just showed you. But notice what the GFS does and even the European at some point over the next three days. You see these squiggly lines and it almost does a loop back. 
That's worrisome because that's also the symptom of it moving into a weak steering environment. There's nothing to nudge it farther to the west faster, to the north, excuse me, faster. It sits and meanders over the same area, and that could have consequences in terms of the overall rainfall totals and fresh water flooding on top of the storm surge flooding. So here's future track, and I want to show you this for two reasons, the outer bands and when the eye makes landfall, but I also have on here the wind. So the wind direction is critical with a tropical system making landfall because where it's coming on shore, that's where it's driving the ocean in low-lying areas, something we call storm surge. So at this point in time, early tomorrow morning, 2.30 in the morning, we're starting to see the onshore winds pick up out by Fort Myers. So this is continuing to pull the ocean up and over low-lying areas and storm surge beginning to rise. As we get to lunchtime on Wednesday, the center, the core of Ian, is still offshore. Not by much, it's sitting just onshore. So that means the core of the strongest winds could be pushing on land at this point. And really just to the south southeast of where this center is, you'll find the strongest winds that are coming on shore. And that looks to be with this model run right near the Fort Myers, Port Charlotte area. So that would lead to the highest storm surge values in these areas if this track verified. In the Tampa Bay area, take note of this. Look at the wind direction at this point. So it's coming over land through the bay. And in this scenario, it'd be pushing the water out of Tampa Bay, and then it moves inland, and then you get a northeasterly wind continuing to blow the water out of Tampa Bay as the center moves inland to the south-southeast of Tampa and really wreaks havoc with ongoing storm surge in Fort Myers and Port Charlotte. This isn't set in stone. It could verify farther to the south and east or farther to the north and west. Nothing is set in stone here yet. It's really going to be a wait-and-see type of forecast and subtle changes in its track and its wobble will really have big impacts in terms of who sees the worst. A lot of people will see it really bad, but there are some areas that might see it much less than what was anticipated, which is really good news. You prepare for the worst and hope for the best. So let's talk about the wind categories here, right? And the wind speeds, that's what you want to know also. You want to know rainfall total, storm surge values, and how strong is the wind going to be where I live? Well, as we go out to Wednesday around lunchtime, at this point in time, it's likely to see Ian at its strongest in its lifetime. So this shows the core of the strongest winds, of, of course, closest to the center. And we've got up to category three winds here just outside the center. So that could be up to 111, up to 129 miles per hour sustained winds at this point. Notice those do stay offshore likely. At this point in time, we're already getting category one winds up and over Fort Myers. Tropical storm force winds, high end tropical storm force near the Sarasota area. And then as we fast forward another seven and a half hours to Wednesday evening, that Category 3 wind could be pushing on land near Sarasota and Tampa. Meanwhile, the winds, again, blowing onshore here by Fort Myers, are blowing anywhere from 74 all the way up to maybe Category 2, 110 miles per hour potentially. And then, of course, it moves over land. We start to see that wind field collapse, but it's still very windy out there, just not seeing as strong a gust and as strong a sustained winds as when it was a high-end uh, major hurricane. So let's now talk storm surge values. Now, remember how I said the areas that are going to have the onshore wind longest will likely see the highest totals. And those totals with the latest update from the National Hurricane Center could approach 12 feet. So over one story high worth of water moving into areas. The good news for the St. Petersburg, Tampa Bay area is that these numbers have actually come down just a little bit. Still up to nine feet still could cause some serious issues. But with what I showed you with the track, and if it does verify to your south, then these, these values will be much, much lower. Now, going to the south, Port Charlotte, Venice, Sarasota, Cape Coral, Fort Myers, you're looking at the highest totals based on the most recent forecast runs with that storm cone. You'd have the longest duration of onshore winds piling in that water in the low-lying areas. And once you get into the inlets and the rivers, it's just funneling that water and rising those levels along all those rivers and estuaries. So you got to keep that in mind there. Even down south to Naples and Marco Island could get storm surge values up to six feet in some locations. With that being said, storm surge warnings. All those watches have been upgraded, meaning that it's coming within the next 24 to 36 hours. Some of those values could be achieved, again, up to 12 feet. On top of that, a new, a, a, 
various amount of other watches and warnings. In fact, many of them have already been upgraded to warnings. But something I want you to take note of here is Tropical Storm watches all the way up into the Carolinas. That's because after it moves inland, you saw that turn north. It's eventually going to bring some strong winds to coastal areas and a lot of rain all the way up into the Carolinas and portions of Georgia. Let's talk rainfall totals now. Now, these are just the uh, fresh water rain, rain coming from the sky on top of the storm surge flooding too. I know that disappeared there, but it was showing areas in the pink here getting up to 9 to 12 inches. In fact, locally, I think that we could see up to a foot, foot and a half in some spots. I just want to refresh you on when we're going to get the next advisory from the National Hurricane Center. I've changed these over to Eastern Time because that's where the storm is located and that's where the Hurricane Center is in Miami. So we'll get it at 5. It'll be 4 Central Time at that point uh, with a cone update. And then after that, there'll be an 8 p.m. and 11 p.m. But as I mentioned at the start of this video, we're now getting hourly updates from the Hurricane Center for changes in its uh, location and, of course, its strength as well. We'll continue to watch this for you. I know there's a lot of information on YouTube, so I'm glad that you're turning to us and trusting us to keep you informed as we head forward from here. And again, hurricane season isn't over, so we'll be with you through the entirety of the season. I'll see you again tomorrow.